here, obviously in the misted area. Okay, so we this is where we do a lot of our uh, disease work. We're, we're pushing conditions, right? Um, so we've got a couple of different things going on. You'll you'll stop over there and see Eric's trials. And so the misting system is really for a head scab. Okay, and so the mist has come on every hour for a couple of minutes to really keep things wet, um, just to ensure that we've got those conditions. Okay, um, and we also grow the pathogen, that fusarium pathogen, in the lab, bring it out here and throw it around. So we grow it like you'd grow mushrooms and we do sort of spawn bags and we'll spread it around. It's not really at risk of you know, causing disease to the area or anything because there's so much of this pathogen just statewide, right? so don't, don't worry about it. Uh, but that's what we do, we, you know, we really do that to try and push conditions and, and really get disease. Um, and then on this other side here, we've got a, a number of different trials. We've got the technician Adam Byrne here as well in the red shirt. He does a lot of the actual spray applications to these plots. These are all small plots that we do. Uh, Martin does a lot of the large plot up in the thumb there. Um, and we have really good correlation between those small plot and large, large plot um, data that we collect. Um, so I guess I'll just talk a little bit about head scab first. If you guys have any questions, you can sing out as we go through this. And these highlights here as well. Are you driving the tractor? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So Lee is um, Lee works with Eric's program, but we we're always going to work together. Um, so just just a quick overview, you know that fusarium pathogen we talk about that also causes um, ear mold in corn, right? It's exactly the same pathogen. So the, the gibberella ear rot is the same thing as head scab or head blight in wheat, fusarium species, and the infection, just like it is in corn, is through the flowers. Okay, so. Flowering is really critical, and we, we primarily think to try and make sure in this case we're infecting the flower. So part of what we're doing here in, in this misted area is uh, part of a national uh, uniform fungicide management trial. So it's done in many states, and that, that gives us a lot of um, additional confidence in our data. And, and if we happen to have a bad year where we just can't get disease, you know, another location like our Ohio State might get disease, so we're able to collect data about managing it with fungicide. As we've been through, uh, we're on the sort of third generation of trials now. The first generation of trials was really just to figure out which chemistries work. Um, and you guys in your handouts have a, a nice um, sheet there of fungicide efficacy. So it's got the, the different chemistries that you can use, different fungicide options, and then a whole list of different diseases across the top. First sort of generation was just sort of getting a sense of which chemistries work, and it's those uh, triazole chemistries, the Carumba, uh, Prasaro, a couple of the main ones, and Polycure, which is now generic, doesn't work quite as well. So they were the first few chemistries that we looked at, and the primary ones that were available. And they're able to certainly suppress the amount of head scab. You should sort of manage your expectations, you're not going to get 100% control rate. You're probably going to reduce the amount of disease by about 50% or so, and the amount of vomitops and things like this too. Uh, by about the same amount. So you, you're not expecting 100% control. Uh, so in 2015 we wrapped up the, the second generation of trials and that was really just looking at the timing. Okay, So if you'd asked us before, we would say as soon as this crop starts flowering, get out there and spray. Okay? But we wanted to know what is the period from the beginning of flowering. How long can we wait to the beginning of flowering? If you can't get into that field right at the start of flowering, how many days do you have? So we had trials out here where we were either spraying at flowering, two, four, or six days beyond flowering. Okay. And, and what we mean by flowering too is that 50% of these heads have anthers on them and flowers coming out. Okay, So 50% or more have to have them, then we're at, at the beginning of flowering. Okay. And so what we found from that work is that we were able to go from beginning of flowering, where you've got flowers on 50% of heads, out to six days beyond the beginning of flowering and still get really good disease control. Start going beyond that, and Martin had a, a, um, a case in his, his area where he went nine days beyond, and you start to lose control. So it looks like we've got about a six day, six to seven day window of good efficacy in terms of uh, putting those chemistries on at the right time. Um, so now what we're doing, this, this sort of third generation trial that we're on, is trying to improve um, management of head scab by splitting applications. So we'll come in at flowering, at the beginning of flowering, and then we'll come in four days post and put a second application on. And we're trying different combinations. We've got uh, Prasaro and Polycure, uh, maybe Columba and Prasaro. 
there's some, some sort of uh, treatments like that to really get a um, And maybe I'll head it over to Michaela to start talking about stripe rust a bit. You want to give us yeah. a bit of a background as yeah. last year as well? Yeah, sounds good. So, uh, stripe rust ended up being uh, quite bad last year. So, that was something we really wanted to investigate this year and narrow down what timings are best to protect that leaf and ultimately get a return on that fungicide application. So we set up a uh, timing trial out here and we are looking at 10 different treatments. So single applications of timings at feet 6, feet 7.5, feet 9, which is that flag leaf, flowering, and then an application a week after flowering. And then also combinations of those timings. So an early with the flowering, an early with the flag leaf, um, a flag leaf with the flowering, and then all three of those timings together. Uh, um, we had a fair amount of foliar diseases out here this year, which was maybe not great for you guys, but good for our trials. So I don't know if you guys still have those leaves Marty passed around. We had a fair amount of stripe rust, which is that yellow, brighter orange with the long stripes on the leaves. There's also a little bit of leaf rust showing up now, which is that darker, more circular spots. Um, and then there's powdery mildew, which is those gray spores and kind of blotches around the leaves. And then a little bit of septoria as well, which is that um, kind of dead tissue with little black specks in it. Um, so those are the things you might be seeing on what we passed around. Um, so I looked at our ratings we took last week on that timing trial I just described. And obviously the worst disease was on the untreated plots. And um, that T1 timing, that feek 6, that was also pretty bad, probably because it was a little too early to protect against stripe rust. Probably applied before stripe rust came in the field and does, wasn't last long enough to provide any good protection. We'll have to wait till the end of the season to see which of those fungicide timings gives us the best yield. Um, so stay tuned for that. Uh, comparing to last year, like Marty mentioned, um, we do have stripe rust and it was reported about the same time um, first in Michigan, which is I think like the first week of May. Um, but it didn't develop quite as quickly. We haven't gotten as many reports of severe fields. We heard of a few fields in uh, Mason County, I think, and Montcalm County, where it's pretty severe, but otherwise it hasn't been quite as severe as last year, which could be due to a couple things. It could be due to different weather conditions, but also due to a different spore load. So last year, stripe rust was much more severe in uh, the southern United States, which means there's a lot more spores that can blow up through those air currents and be deposited here in Michigan. So there was probably just a little less spore pressure. Um, right now we're a little better off than we were last year. Um, this plot I'm looking at probably about like 30 to 40 percent covered in stripe rust, whereas this time last year we were at 50 to 60. So we are a little better off than last year, but we still have some time that it could catch up. We'll have to wait and see. Um, besides the timing trial, we also have another trial on the end there um, looking at the interaction between fertility and fungicides. Um, so we're looking at a low and a higher rate of uh, nitrogen and then looking at uh, fungicide applications made at flowering or at that T1 feet 6 plus flowering. Uh, we are interested in this trial because some previous research by other groups has shown that higher nitrogen can actually increase both foliar diseases Red scab. Um, so we wanted to investigate that here in Michigan and also there has been research showing a better um, response from a fungicide under higher nitrogen uh, conditions. So maybe a synergism between that fungicide and that nitrogen. So we hope to investigate that with that trial. We also have another trial looking at the same thing up in Saginaw across four different varieties. So stay tuned for those results. Um, these trials here are both on ambassador, so a pretty susceptible variety to both foliar diseases and uh, head scab. Does it, anyone have any questions on anything that we've talked about so far? I'm just yeah. curious, why are you still running the mist system when you're well past flowering? The infection stage is over. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good point, and I think we need to dial this in a little bit more. So last year, um, sorry, the question was why are we still running the misting system? even though, you know, we're sort of beyond that infection period, and that's a very fair point. Do you have any good suggestions on that? <laughs> but we could still get an increase in Don. Um, oh, okay. That bit okay. definitely, yeah. right. Okay. And so maybe, maybe not infection. 
Right. Both dying levels. Okay. Yeah, I good. guess I guess the only other thing I can think of is we might get additional um, um, travel through the kernel infection rate. Yeah. So you're going to get right. So you will see those. Right. I don't know if that'll be. Yeah, I guess it's just depending on the timing. If it, if it happens before things, we come through and do that head scab rating just just before things turn, because you know those the scab, you know how it looks, right? Those scabs start to show up with those little white white areas on the on the heads there. So I guess um, you know if that infection from um, kernel to kernel occurs before that, then we can capture that in our ratings. But definitely the don. And you know I think uh, the data I had from 2015. We're overdoing it here. I'm not being fair to the chemistries, sure. right? We show really good differentiation with, in terms of head scab. So you can see Ambassador and the control gets so much head scab. We spray it right, we can really reduce the amount of head scab, the actual disease. Mm -hmm. Then you look at the DON data, there's not much difference, right? We're being really unfair. You look at Martin's data and there's good reduction, right? But, but we know that from, and again, that's why it's important to do this sort of work across multiple sites. And that work supported by the uh, United uh, Wheaton Barley Head Scab Initiative, a really important work and it's just really nice to be able to work with other groups like that. I guess just the other thing I was going to say is just there's a lot of different diseases in here, right? Um, so the striped brass is the very, you know, stripy, light coloured spores on there. We've got leaf rust, orange pustules sort of scattered across the leaf surface. And actually the, the leaf rust is actually going to its second spore stage as well. So you can see in here we've got what we call telia. It doesn't matter too much in terms of management and whatnot now, but, but that's what it is. And you know, there's really dark stuff now spreading across the leaf. That's just the second stage of that, that stripe rust um, spore type. Um, we've got a lot of powdery mildew. You know, obviously it's pretty obvious to, to identify, right, that grey sort of powdery look to it. Um, yeah, yeah, of course, please, man. Uh, every time you walk into a different field, you see different things, and um, I, I can't help but mention that this time of year, all of a sudden, some heads, individual heads, will turn white, and so maybe it's an opportune time to touch on that, especially for you uh, field scouts out there. So if you have an individual head that's uh, turned white as I walk through a field, even without thinking, I'll just pull on it. Well, that tells me it's probably not a, at the stem level. Sometimes we have stem bores, and it'll, it'll break off about two inches below the head, and you can see that there's feeding there. So it's incidental. It's, not, it's never been important. Uh, at least I've never seen it significant. What bothers me more is throughout here is a couple of root diseases. What are the other um, diseases that can cause heads to bleach pre prematurely? And, what, and actually, what's going on there? Well, the nutrients are just being cut off. I mean, it's like tomatoes in your garden. All of a sudden, overnight, they just wilt down. You say, what happened? Well, or what, what did that? Well, you don't know. All you know for sure is that the xylem and phloem have been cut off, and that's robbed of any nutrients, and it's not going anywhere. And sometimes you might get a few shrunken kernels in the combine, otherwise nothing at all. There's a couple of interesting things here, and especially for your scouts. Now, this is without, we're gonna, I'm gonna ask Marty or Michaela to culture this. Um, but there's a couple of things. One is eye spot. We don't see it in uh, Michigan very much. It's actually your stomping grounds. <laughs> it's Australian and other temperate areas. But when we got this, I think this was wheat uh, separated by one year of soybeans. But sometimes with a little closer rotations, we can get into it. And I think uh, uh, Eric might touch on this too because this is an eye opener and I don't know if we can get ratings. But here's a couple of samples. This is a typical lesion, also called straw breaker, that you might pass around. And it's kind of the, the defined blackish area way at the base. And so if you guys see that, that's one of the value of these field meetings for us is we always learn something <laughs> from all of you. Um, but if you see that, we'd just like to know. We want to know the prevalence of some of these diseases so we can target them. That's why we're just falling over ourselves with stripe rust. That really caught us off guard two years ago. And so Eric's program and our management are shifting to that because that's something that can walk away with 30, 40% of your yield. Another disease, lower stem disease, that can take us is what? When you see a field, a third of it turn whitish prematurely, and, and you're more con you've seen this more often, it's uh, called take-all. It's another um, fungal disease. Also reflects tight uh, rotations with wheat and other grasses. 
And to me, this would be a little bit perhaps more, more typical symptom, kind of a, a general blackening of the lower stem. Uh, again, that's not confirmed. Um, so I know enough to say that's what it kind of looks like, but I can't confirm that. But if you see something like that, I'd sure like to have you send that in. As you know, the wheat program pays for the diagnostic work, and we would just love to have a better handle on everything that's going on there. But at least of today, those are some of the things that are causing premature uh, bleaching of the heads. There's also some uh, barley yellow dwarf in here. That doesn't always bleach the head prematurely, unless it was a fall infection. Um, but uh, that's just something, a uh, couple of things going on here. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So with the, with the uh, lot of ryegrass and uh, cereal rye going on, the cover crops are flying on corn, and then you go to soybeans and go back to wheat. Is that creating a problem with the grass diseases? That's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, off the cuff, and I, I don't know. I'll, I'll say I don't think so. My biggest concern um, in terms of diseases would it, if it would be a bridge for aphids. That's my biggest fear. Something that can really infect our wheat. So we have oats or barley as cover or wheat. We don't get a complete kill and then we plant wheat into it. Those aphids can move and also be infected with the virus, move from that crop to the more attractive crop coming up. And so that would be my single uh, biggest concern. But fungal Theoretically, I'd suggest um, that, um, yeah, they, they, they would probably have many grasses in common um, and that it, maybe they wouldn't flourish, but it might harbor the, to the organism to an extent. But I don't know, but I think uh, your question's very good and I suspect something we have to watch. But aphids would be my number one concern. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Okay. Yeah. We had, um, was it, we had uh, wheat in the field behind us Last year, I think. Two years, two years. Two, yeah, two years ago, and then this, the previous year was Kurt Steinke was doing some work in his facility, and this had been allowed to sort of volunteer and whatnot. And we had, oh. remember that we had wheat streak mosaic virus jump across, and it did, did a real number. So that just sort of goes to show it's a good idea to control that that volunteer wheat as well. Um, you know, that, that's that's known across the U.S. I guess that particular problem. Well, part of tillage playing part of all this. Weed control, mold control, and, and fungus is going to We're on a three-year full rotation. We mow more than wheat, shovel off the corn, and no-till or minimum-till beans in, and no-till wheat in. Yeah. Another really good question. No question with, I think, all of our crops in general. Um, a rule of thumb is, yeah, you leave more residue. Many of these fungal diseases will uh, persist in there. In the case of wheat, I would suggest that uh, some of the septorias can overwinter or in that residue um, but is it significant and that I can't ever been able to show that because of that residue that we see much difference but in general uh, absolutely um, it's generally true where it really just bangs us it, but is as these low uh, these uh, root of uh, these fungal uh, diseases um, and to an extent scab um, get to give you an example, if you would, if you go corn to wheat, you know, corn grows better scab than wheat does. <laughs> I mean, it's that hot. And so if you have all your stubble on the top, your corn, if you mow board plow that, you almost r decrease, you almost, almost eliminate that threat of scab to that next wheat crop. That's how big a deal that is. Um, I did a trial once that if I chisel plowed it, I got rid of half the stalks and about half the disease. If I mow board it, my plots were, weren't were big enough. I mean, I'd have to be acres, but, and we did this with New York or uh, Cornell, and uh, it really makes a difference. So that's a really striking um, um, similarity. Soybeans to wheat, I don't know if, boy, I'm really getting out of my depth here. I'm gonna turn this over to Marty. Soybeans to wheat, I, I can't think of any additional risk. No, I, I, yeah. I didn't know you'd done this trial, so that's really cool. Yeah. Do you have that data? Yeah. Is it on a floppy drive or? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Same with that other data yeah, is. Yeah. All the data on the top of this. <laughs> yeah, Martin's been doing so many trials over the years. What we want to try and do is, is what's sort of called a meta-analysis. We want to pull all those years of data together to try and look at everything at once, right? To try and 
you know, on average, how are things sort of performing. Uh, and we've got a good idea, and he's got it in his head, right, but we'd like to have it written down as well. Um, yeah, and, yeah, and I, I would agree with that tillage comment, you know, um, uh, my, my coll our colleague Carl Bradley had a little bit of data on this as well. And, and tillage, you know, planting wheat in a corn stubble is certainly a concern. But in terms of management, you know, picking that resistant variety seemed to give you the best disease control, followed by uh, a fungicide at flowering, and then, you know, that, that, that uh, crop management, you know, planting in the to corn residue versus planting in the soybean residue. So it, it's a factor, and, and you can still get spores moving in, right? So the fungus produces a couple of types of spores. There's one that's sort of short range, sort of rain splashed. And then there's a, an ASCO spore that's potentially wind disseminated too. Okay, so that can, under the right conditions, spread spread quite a ways. And, and this fusarium pathogen, it you know it can infect soybean roots as well. We don't really understand that as well. It's 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 nowhere near as um, a greater risk in soybeans as it is in corn. Absolutely, it's you know completely different. But but it is capable of, of colonising those too. So. Other questions? Yep. That was my question. You half answered it. Can you go back over the years before we started no-tilling with your research and find out how much more of these diseases are prevalent now with all this no-tilling and stuff, if there is a difference? No, we could do some background work from other states, uh, but I don't know of any, but there's probably some that allude to that. Now, if we were going to weed on wheat, understand that is such a big deal we couldn't even address that because the wheat would be dead already from the soil fungicides so it'd be very hard to to measure mildew or septoria i would suggest that trust that it's a problem but going from soybeans to wheat uh, to corn to wheat uh, be very relevant but it also take a long long time <laughs> uh, because of the rotation uh, but i don't know of any work but that'd be something uh, Michaela could research uh, in the literature. <laughs> Sorry. And another factor to that too is variety development, right? That, that's that's been changing as well, so that sort of complicates things, uh, and potentially you know weather patterns to some extent. But yeah. Any other questions? Yep. All about this plot here. A lot of these kernels are ate off or never developed. Is there something going on in this one? You know what I think this was the front of this. Um, so we had some significant barley yellow dwarf in the front of this field, and we also think some pH soil problems in the beginning of the season. So it had a really rough start, I'll put it that way. So yeah, I think some of these just were super stunted at that time and never developed. This is your headland, so yeah. it's not part of the trial. But yeah, right. so these first uh, two here aren't part of any of the trials, so a little bit of relief, but. That was a Friday afternoon plot, So was some of that early spike of abortion frost related? Oh. Yeah, that's definitely another possibility. I know we were talking to some of those guys and they thought they were seeing some of that in their field back there, so. Oh yeah. A wrap up? Okay, no worries. Well, I think we're good then. So, um, thank you all. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you. Francis.